John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that boss the next. Big job there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, down goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock him, sock him, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull*****. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, what's good? Thanks for checking back in. Thanks for letting us be a part of your respective lives for the next power hour or so. It is episode 502 of the Anakin Florian Podcast live on YouTube, the DraftKings Network as well, DraftKings YouTube channel, Anakin Florian Podcast YouTube channel, at Anakin Florian Pod if you want to follow the show, johnanik.com if you want to buy merchandise supporting the show, promo code UFC304 for 15% off. Ken Flo still in South Carolina, still fucking working on vacation. How do the kids feel about you perpetually breaking away to... Uh, to generate and create content while you're all trying to be having recreational time. <laughs> well, they all get to leave the house is what happens. Uh, right now, it's raining like crazy over here. So, uh, yeah, it needed a little quiet. So, um, uh, they're, ha- they're having fun. They're having fun. We've been spending a lot of time at the beach and uh, the pool. It's been fun. Good. All right. Well, we were live earlier this week. We were joined by Domina Cruz and Daniel Cormier. Today will be just a little bit more comprehensive when it comes to our UFC 304 preview. If you want long ghost thoughts, those are available to you right now on episode 501. One thing that I did mention, though, on our last episode, Ken Flo, and uh, I know you do come from a medical family to whatever degree. None of your siblings, by the way, are doctors, correct? No. My, my dad kind of uh, steered us all away from being a doctor. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. How come? Well, I, I think at that time, uh, the insurance companies were kind of uh, not allowing you to, to make as much as, uh, you know, as it was like when he first started in private yeah. practice. So yeah. uh, he kind of saw it all going to shit. He's like, unless you're going to be a dentist or you're going to like get paid in cash, like you're going to be a plastic surgeon. He was like, yeah, probably not worth it. That, that's what, that was his take on it anyway. All right. Well, that's an honest answer. Yeah. That's a really honest answer. <laughs> I know Dr. Davidson, I believe both of his offspring are going to be doctors. Nice. I don't know if he uh, pushed, pressured, bullied them in that direction or not. Seemingly not, but I just don't know. All right. So, but I did mention that last week I had a colonoscopy. Okay. Uh, have you yep. had one of those, Ken Flo? I did indeed a couple of years ago, my man. Yep. So I guess I would ask you and you're an expert when it comes to staring death in the face, cutting weight for mixed martial arts contests, right? So how was your fast? How was it cleaning out your colon? Maybe you don't want to talk about this. I know some people use the liquid. I use the pills. Yeah. I got down to a high school weight and Damn. I had a pretty horrifying experience because I ended up being the last patient and it ended up being a two day fast instead of one. Ooh. So how did that go for you? And did you have any sort of bad flashbacks <laughs> when you were like 30 hours into your fast. <laughs> yeah, listen, I did I did the fast. I did not do the 48 hours. Um it wasn't too bad. You know, it wasn't too bad. I think um you know, I I, I kind of knew the importance of doing that for that particular uh procedure, so yeah. you know, that was kind of my motivation, but um it it wasn't horrible. I I asked to be put under. Uh I, I, Yeah, I, I went to wanted, sleep. Yeah, my I, doctor I would put you to sleep. It. Yeah. Yeah. No liquid. And yeah. if you are not yet 40, maybe you want to fast forward for the next 60 seconds. But they're doing <laughs> colonoscopies, at least in this country, when you're 45 and not 50 in most cases right yes. now. But yeah, I was out. I was fucking out. I'm talking to them about the Anakin Florian podcast. The next thing you know, I wake up, I'm eating fucking graham crackers, feeling like a million bucks. <laughs> but dude, I felt bad. And yes, I yeah. wanted my colon to be as clean as possible. So I yeah. wasn't really ingesting a lot of calories liquid wise on that first day chicken broth or gatorade or ginger ale i wasn't really leaning into all of that i was drinking a lot of water but bro i had to like sleep it off after the second dose of pills i felt like i was in the middle of a fucking weight cut i'm in the shower leaving for my colonoscopy you know they tell me my arrival time fucking 3 p.m i go in at 5 45 p.m bro i was like 138 pounds damn Dude. dude You know, well, hey, that means you can probably make that weight pretty easily. Then. Well, that's why I think I can now make flyweight, but I don't know if I can make flyweight. Actually, now I'm not even sure I can make 26. 
but the general safe Saud won't corner me at Bantamweight. Although against my twin bro, he would. And I will add one other thing. It, it's yeah. an important procedure to have because we had a close uh, family friend that um, by the time he found out there was something wrong, uh, you know, it was it was too late. He he passed very shortly thereafter. So um, they used to do it at 50, as you mentioned. Now they're doing it at 45. So if you're in and around that age, get it done. Don't ignore it because, um, you know, it's hard to kind of overlook it. And by the time you have some kind of symptoms that, that are funny, uh, it might be too late. So definitely get checked out, guys. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, it is the only cancer that you can pre-screen for, colon cancer. You can really yeah. get ahead of it proactively. And I guess in the nature of informing, I'll just say this, you know, uh, oftentimes they do find polyps, right? And they remove them with a cold snare immediately. It's completely yes. pain free. I must have ingested 5,000 fucking calories after this colonoscopy. <laughs> like, anesthesiologist, who, by the way, was gone by the time they took me in. But he said to me, you can eat anything you want tonight. And yeah. man, did I take him up on that? I ate like <laughs> 5,000 calories, but I had one polyp. Uh, it ended up being benign, but they removed that. Oh. And but I have to go back in five years instead of 10. And sometimes if you have a precancerous polyp, maybe you go back sooner. But mm -hmm. I'm almost inclined to go back every two years because right. <laughs> I just feel like, why not try to get ahead of this? So uh, that yeah. was my experience. And if that experience helps you to whatever degree, uh, so be it. But it is UFC 304 Fight Week, Kenny. And we have a lot of things to get into. And one thing I teased last week, and we do have our poll question results as well before we get into Ken Flo and Brian Petrie's picks is that I want to spin this around on you. I know you've done a lot of fighter meetings in your day, but like if you are sitting down with Leon Edwards, as I will be here in the next 48 hours or so. Yes. What are you asking him? I'm asking him, among other things, and I try to be economical with this because I have several broadcast partners waiting in the wings. Is there one thing or are there two things or three things that Bilal Muhammad does that you are focused on? Mm -hmm. Things that he does well or otherwise because of this narrative that Bilal is just sort of, you know, eight out of 10 across the board. So what are you asking Leon Edwards as you get ready to call this fight? If you were, better? well, I think you ask way better questions than, than I do my friend, if I'm being honest, but I'll say this. I, I think that I'd be curious to hear his thoughts on, on both of these guys. How does the other guy win the fight? How does the other guy win the fight? Because that gives you a really good gauge on how they're thinking about this or if they've even thought about that at all. Because I think that it's super important to think about how the enemy, how it. the opponent is thinking. Um, and it also indicates whether they prepared for those scenarios or not. So I, I think that's always uh, an, industry, an interesting question. I'm going to absolutely take that to them. And uh, thanks for doing the homework for me. At Anik Florian Pod, poll questions in advance of UFC 304. And we'll have Ken Flo answer, answer these very quickly right here, right now. Of the two underdog title challengers vying for UFC gold in Manchester, Ken Flo, in whom are you more confident to spring the upset? Odds are part of this, right? Bilal Muhammad plus 170 against Leon Edwards or Curtis Blades plus 300 versus Tom Aspinall. So a lot of people like the chalk. They like the incumbents, the champions, the English guys this weekend, but 55% of our respondents like Bilal Muhammad, shorter price, obviously, 45% like Curtis Blades. Are you more convicted in one of those underdogs than another, Ken Flo, or no? I am. I'm definitely way okay. more convicted with Bilal. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then next up, the price here is short on all of these athletes if you feel convicted in any direction. Forced to place a bet, Ken Flo, on any of these men. One guy to get a win in Manchester. Who are you backing? We gave out four names. 34% of people like Bobby Green, King Green, minus 125. 25.6% like Patty Pimblett, plus 105. 29.5% like Mohamed Mokayev, minus 125. 10.9% like Manel Kopp, plus 105. So great betting territory, pick them range for all four of those athletes. Who do you feel most convicted on of those four to get a win here Saturday night? I would say King Green. All right. King Green minus 125 right now yeah. on DraftKings Sportsbook. And to that end, this month of July is ending with an absolute heater. Ladies and gentlemen, UFC 304 offering up no fewer than two title fights in 
You can get your own crown by jumping in on all the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC. So Leon Edwards, about a two-to-one favorite right now against Bilal Muhammad. It's a rematch for the welterweight title. Interim heavyweight championship also on the line. Can Tommy Aspinall continue to live up to the appreciable hype? We will find out Sunday morning. Whole pay-per-view main card is absolutely loaded. And speaking of loaded and stacking and loading, if you're new to DraftKings, you're going to want to hear this. New customers, you bet just $5 to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. All you need to do, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, not now, but right now, and use code AFPOD, that's code AFPOD for new customers, to get $150 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Deposit and eligibility restrictions apply. See terms and responsible gaming resources at dkng.co slash MMA. All right. It is now time for the main event challenge presented to you by KennyFlorian.com as we go three wide and welcome in runner up for Girl Dad of the Year in 2023, yes. Brian Petrie. What's up, Brian? Hey, how's it going? I'm glad you guys talked about a colon at the top of the hour. <laughs> Very important. Best friend of mine who's my age, maybe a couple months younger than me, had colon cancer oh, at 36. Geez. It can happen, baby. Get yeah. checked. I'm glad you've done it. And another thing, John, you weighed 138 pounds. I don't think I've ever weighed 138 pounds. <laughs> I weighed 100 pounds. And I remember hitting the scale, going over 100, and then never looking again until I was like 220. So I've never been 138. Dude. So, I uh, was afraid to weigh myself the next day for fear it would say 158, you know? Wow, so what are we doing? Like Ken Flo going 55 to 78? No, I, it wasn't that bad. Uh, <laughs> I didn't weigh myself, actually. You know, I don't weigh myself a lot. What's the heaviest you've ever been, John? My daughter would probably tell you 164, but anyone okay. who was with me at Gettysburg College in 1997, okay. I mean, I felt like I had a fried chicken sub with lettuce and mayo like every night. So, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I freshman 15 doesn't even begin to describe it. And the fact that I had attractive women wanting to like make out with me at that hey. time, like what the fuck were they thinking? Yeah. It looked like someone injected my face with fucking <laughs> ghee butter, you know? <laughs> The the big the big face the big face gets them, bud. You know, you know, the big face gets them. I've drawn a few uh, you know, I'm like a Venus flytrap sometimes with, <laughs> with this with this round face of mine. Uh, yeah. So I no, curious. I mean, I don't know. Was I ever 180? Lord nah, hope not. not. But if I was in radio and not television or I did something else for a living, who knows what I would weigh. Yeah. So pronunciation of the week selectively is going to be back. Okay. And Leon Edwards is fighting a guy whose name at times can be butchered a little bit. So, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we all know this man. Yes. And uh, his nickname is Remember the Name, Bri. Sure. Who's Leon fighting Saturday night in Manchester? So, for the longest time, I said Bilal. And then I met yeah. him in Nashville. And yeah. I was so terrified of messing it up. But it's Bilal yeah. Muhammad. Wow. That's what we're all working towards. Again, yeah. just a PSA, right, Ken Flo? I mean, that's all we're really talking about. Like, Paul Simon, you can call me out, right? I I've been <laughs> screwing it up. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> uh, no, we screwed it up on UFC telecast. But uh, for the record, here is the, uh, the audio file. Bilal, remember the name, Muhammad. <laughs> Please see this. Oh, I played it. Remember the yeah. name Muhammad. I'll take the whole thing again, please. Listen to how he says it the first time. What a fucking gangster. It's coming. Bilal, remember the name Muhammad. <laughs> That's it. That's dope. That's dope. Bilal, remember the name Muhammad. Dude, the way he punctuates that. Mm hmm. On that first take, Ken Flo, Muhammad, like that sounds better than. Remember the name, Bilal Muhammad. Bruce Buffer, get out of the way. I like it. <laughs> All right. We have nine fights to preview yes. today. So 18 fighters in theory for you guys to watch film on. And. I feel like all 18 of these athletes deserve to have us break down these fights. This is one of the biggest cards of the year. That's why we're going nine deep. That's why you get $2,000 to spend when we get to place your bets. Dateline Manchester, here we go. So we were going to begin with what was an early prelim at middleweight on draft number one of the fight card. And I do type a script for the Anakin Florian podcast. And I wrote here, Bri, yeah. 
Feels like this fight could end up on pay-per-view if the matchmakers get cute between now and Saturday. And lo and behold, third draft, Christian Leroy Duncan, Gregory Robocop Rodriguez is now on pay-per-view. So we are going to begin with a fight that was on pay-per-view on an early draft and is now an early prelim, despite the fact that it is a title eliminator in the flyweight division. The undefeated 23-year-old Mohamed Mokayev, minus 125, Manel Kopp, plus 105. Brian Petrie, we'll start with you. Mokayev, 6-0 in the UFC after the March win over Alex Perez. Your thoughts on him here against Manel Starboy Cop. Man, what a fight to kick this off. I love this fight. When it got announced, I I absolutely was drooling. Both these guys are going to fight for the title, regardless of the outcome of this fight. Um, It threw a lot of pause in me because I've been on the Manel Cop train for a while. It's almost like I'm betraying one of my children when I pick (laughs) against them, and I've never picked against them. But that's where I'm at here. Muhammad Mukayev is so good at what he does. He'll get shut down in the wrestling. He'll use his hands a little bit. He'll open the wrestling back up. This guy's laying at three takedowns in every fight besides the Cody Durden fight. That's just because he took his neck home early. This is a dude who's relentless, cardio on point. I know he's young. And when we get young fighters, we want to throw a big paw sign up like, whoa, dude's only this, you know 20-something years old. But this dude is really good at what he does. He's confident. Both these guys are confident. There maybe was a gym brawl in Vegas that's now leaking out online. Who knows what happened? But I love this fight for uh, for both guys in the standing of the division. I just think it's a bad matchup for Manel Cop. We haven't really seen him fight a pure grappler let, uh, yet outside the UFC. That was kind of a hiccup for him, getting taken down, getting submitted, a couple of losses like that. He's a world's away from that fighter. He's, he's much better now. He's in Vegas. He's training. He's super athletic, and he can put Makayev out. But... That wrestling, that grinding, the hometown. Give me Mokayev. I like the low number as well. I'm sorry, Manel Cop. I got to go against you. All right, Ken Flo. Portugal's Manel Cop. Four wins in a row. Tremendous fighter. Versatile finisher. BJJ black belt. Obviously, there are levels to that, but he has a lot of submission wins. Mm-hmm. Hasn't fought since last September. Was to face Nico Lau, right, in a rematch in January. And you figured he would have been motivated, Kenny, for that fight because it was a split decision loss. But he missed weight by three and a half pounds, so that fight didn't happen. Withdraws from another scheduled Nicolau rematch in April. So morning weigh-in on Friday, I mean, not trying to overstate the lead story here, but all eyes are going to be on Manel Kopp. It's a huge fight for the flyweights. I don't know if it was moved off of pay-per-view because of the worry about the weight, uh, but it's a pick and fight, and it's a damn big one, Ken Flo. Which way are you going between Mokayev and Kopp? Well, I think it's important to to talk about that weight cut and uh, the fact that that hasn't always been uh, his, his strong suit. Um, and I think it's a great indicator uh, as to how serious he's taking this fight. Um, Manel Kopp is a phenomenal fighter. I think if you look back at his fight against Felipe Dos Santos, who is a fantastic fighter and an excellent striker as well, you could see that Manal Cup was just kind of at a different level, especially when it came to his counter striking. And for Mokayev, that is not his strong suit at all. He's not a great striker. I mean, he has uh, a big deficiency in, in that area, in my opinion. However, it oftentimes doesn't matter because he just finds a way to get to the clinch uh, to the body lock or to the legs, and he puts you on your ass. And that's what he needs to do here against Manal Cup. And he absolutely has the ability to be able to do that for 15 minutes. There's no question about it. Mokayev is just that good, similar to Habib. His striking wasn't anything phenomenal at all, and he looked like he was vulnerable. It didn't matter. He was unbeatable. No one could stop him from getting to his legs or to your body yeah. and putting you on your back. So um, Manal Kopp, though, I think can take advantage, especially early on in this fight. And Brian, I agree with you. I love Manal Kopp as a fighter. I think this is a bad matchup for Mokayev, but I think I have a solution to how I can satisfy both of those things later on when it comes to the betting portion. However, I am going to pick Mokayev here as of right now. Best in the business. <laughs> All right, next prelim in the welterweight division. Duval County stand up for your guy, Preston Parsons, the minus 155 betting favorite against Oban Elliott, who is the plus 130 underdog. So Parsons out of Jacksonville Beach, Florida, Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt, actually fought platinum Mike Perry back in 2015. Mm-hmm. You buy that pay-per-view, Petrie, last weekend or no? Uh, Buy it, no. Yeah, all right. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, we have Parsons (laughs) facing the Welsh gangster, Elliot, 
who has won six in a row. That included his UFC debut back in February at UFC 298 BP. Who do you love? Both these guys are very similar. They're sticky. They stick on you, man. They, they That's what they want. They want to take you down. They want to smother you. And they want to eventually try to get a submission. Oban Elliott, the, the better the competition has come is the less finishes he's, he's been able to have. I think he looks pretty good, though. I think he looks a pretty like a pretty good, solid prospect. Meanwhile, Preston Parsons has been making his bones over in the UFC. Up and down UFC career. I think the cardio a little bit maybe is in question because he's tough in that first round. He's tough in the second round. Third round, though, could get a little shaky. Maybe he gets out positioned. His striking isn't the cleanest. But I think this could be a grappling affair. And I just, I lean towards Oban Elliott in this, the dog uh, play here. I'll probably put a little baby, little baby shekels on it just because we're getting plus money. But uh, yeah, give me Oban Elliott. But this is a tough fight to predict. Ken Flo, Preston Parsons, minus 155. Oban Elliott, plus 130. Featured prelim on ESPN. Plus, who do you like? Yeah, yeah, they are similar fighters. I agree absolutely, Brian. I, I think the one thing that stands out for me, obviously, is the fact that Preston has faced tougher competition in my mm-hmm. experience. I think his footwork is a little better. He may be a tad sharper, maybe on the ground. So that's why I'm kind of leaning towards uh, Parsons here. Um Oban Elliott, uh, he struggles a little bit with his footwork. It's awkward at times, and he mm-hmm. becomes vulnerable there. Um, and th- that's why I like Preston Parsons in this one. All right, next up, women's strawweight division, where Molly McCann now resides. She is the minus 298 betting favorite against Bruna Brazil, who comes back plus 240. So McCann, I just thought, looked so happy and mm-hmm. physically fantastic. That was her divisional debut earlier this year. Now we'll see what she can produce on another big stage in England, Bri. Yeah. Facing the Fighting Nerds rep, yeah. Bruno Brazil. What do you think about this one at 115 BP? I tell you what, it's hard to win money against the Fighting Nerds, but I'm going to take Meatball Molly McCann. She's been in the wrong weight class her whole career. She's not a very, I mean, she's not big, right? I mean, she was two feet in front of me at one point, and she's not a big woman. Right. She's small. 115 is the exactly right weight class for her. I know she's had some off uh off the cage stuff that she's been talking about recently, which I applaud her uh, to deal with everything she's dealing with and get back in there. Mental health is very important. And I think she's in the right spot. She went through a camp with Patty. They both look to be in phenomenal shape. There's a picture that came out on Instagram. They're both abbed up. They're both ready to go. My only concern is the numbers a little high on Molly. Bruno Brazil kind of turned uh, Dana White's um, contender series on the head when she hit that heel hook. She's good on the ground, and that's where Molly struggles. But since Bruna has had her shot in UFC and has fought UFC competition, she's been inconsistent. I think if Molly works the defends the takedowns, keeps us on the feet, it should be her all day. She could actually get a nice, beautiful uh, knockout, uh, which is what I'm going to play this by to, to try to shave that number off a little bit. And I can't wait for that crowd to go nuts when she uh, when Meatball gets that knockout. Yeah, I'm excited to uh to just witness all of it. Bruno Brazil one and two in the UFC right now after a loss to Loma Luke Boon Me back in February. Meatball Molly McCann, like kind of like a gluten free though, like vegan meatball now as a yeah, straw weight sure. flow, right? Not the full fat meatball. <laughs> She's 34 years of age. She's seven five seven and five in the UFC McCann has obviously been up and down at times. But I believe she's getting better and more focused and more of a fighting prime state now than ever before. Right division. She's about a three to one favorite here. Ken, flow your thoughts. Yeah, hold the breadcrumbs on that uh, on that (laughs) meatball. Um, I I I like this fight. You know, Brian did a great um, breakdown here. I don't really have a whole lot to add. I I think that Bruna doesn't really have a whole lot of ways to win this fight. From what I can tell, based on what I've seen, I just don't know where she wins this fight. I, I think Molly's going to be the better striker. I don't think that's going to be much of a challenge as far as you know stopping take takedowns and things. I think this is a good setup for McCann to get, get a win here. All right, next up, featured prelim in the men's featherweight division, Nathaniel Wood, minus 485. Daniel Pineda, plus 370. So Pineda has been in and out of the UFC. He's 5-6. and six. With a no contest thus far in 12 UFC starts. Hasn't fought since a decision loss to Alex Caceres. That was June of 2023. And then on the other side, you have Nathaniel Wood. Trains under UFC veteran Brad Pickett. 7-3 and three in his UFC career, Bri. Mm-hmm. That's across two divisions. He actually won a Polaris grappling match against Caceres earlier this year. Last mm-hmm. MMA fight, though. Lost to Mohamed Naimov, UFC 294. So... Big price, Brian. Yeah. Nathaniel Wood, a near five to one favorite over Pineda. Your thoughts on this one? 
deep price and I don't want to derail the, the, the podcast too much, but it's been stuck in my fucking head. Kenny, I don't want to put you in the spot here. You're the master of accents. I can't do any of them. Can you do an English accent, my guy? Uh, is, is there anything in your repertoire to do that? No? no not great. Not great. No. I always screw it up. Like the Australian, the, in, yeah. the English accent, and not just Tough. not my strong suit. Yeah. I can it just is do tricky. Very cartoony, like, hello. Like, that's it. That's all <laughs> right, I can right, do. Right, right. Like an asshole. So it's tricky. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Africa yeah. England, right? Yes. You got to be real careful yeah. telling yeah. a South African they sound fucking Australian. Yeah. Right. Yep. right. So, uh, but yeah, too bad Jason Anik, like his whole resume as a musical theater guy, it said all these different accents. So if he was here, oh, he could pull some off. He's soft though. So would he do it on the spot? You know, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, so, I love you. Sorry oh, for man. derailing that. I just was curious because my buddy can do a phenomenal English accent. Um, listen, Nathaniel Wood, it's a shame he can't make 135. Because he's not a 145-er. He's, he's bulked up a little bit, but he's 5'6". Mm. At least he's listed at 5'6". But I know 135 killed him. I've seen the pictures. 145, though, is just he's just a little too undersized. In this huge number, if I had the cojones, if I had the balls, I'd run Daniel Pineda. The only problem is this guy's, you know, his, his, his piss has been hot a couple times. I don't know who we're going to get in there. He's up and down in the career. But the guy can fucking sling. He can put you out. He's well-rounded. Yeah. And Nathaniel Wood is going to have to get in that pocket against a bigger guy. And when he gets in that pocket, his chin sometimes isn't, doesn't live up to the test. You know what I mean? John Dotson got him years ago. Andre Feely put him down twice. His chin doesn't live up to the hype. He's fighting up in weight, in my opinion. He's a smaller guy against a big, heavy-handed guy. But Pineda, gas tank issues possibly in this huge number. Again, if I had the balls like Ken Flo, I know he's going to pick Pineda. I would I would, I would, would lay this and I would play, play the number and probably Pineda by knockout. But I'm going to play it safe. I'm not going to have action in this fight. But for the record, my pick will be Nathaniel Wood. Ken Flo, the night on which you and I debuted as a UFC broadcast team together, January 20th, 2012, Nashville, Tennessee, Daniel Pineda makes his UFC debut, submits Pat Schilling in 97 seconds. I guess that's neither here nor there. Nathaniel Wood on the other side, three and one since moving up to 145 pounds. Ken Flo, your thoughts on this one? Really a widespread. I wouldn't imagine you'd, uh, you'd have any action on either side, but I could be wrong. I love that little tidbit. All right, in. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, this is a tricky one, in it, in it, in, in it, it, Brian. In it. In um, it. So <laughs> this is tricky, just based on the numbers alone, you know, and the fact that Pineda has a lot of potential. This is a very good fighter. If mm -hmm. he shows up, he's a problem. And sometimes Nathaniel Wood will kind of engage in a fight that might not necessarily be the best for him, just because he's just so damn tough. However. Based on what we've seen, I think Nathaniel Wood is the better fighter. I think Wood wins this fight. Um, he's good everywhere, man. And I think he's just more consistent. Uh, I think we know what Nathaniel Wood is going to show up. And mm -hmm. um, even if Pineda is at his best, I think it's still um, a, a tough fight for Pineda. Um, I, I like Wood here. I just also think he's just a little cleaner when it comes to the striking game, especially in regards to like moving his head and counter striking. I like wood here. Nice. All right. We will stay in this Ilya Topuria led division for the main card opener. Arnold Allen, modest 250 <laughs> Giga Chikadze plus 205. So Chikadze, eight and one in the UFC after a win over, yep, Alex Caceres. There he is again. That was He's last everywhere. August, though, in Singapore. Chikadze's had a lot of fights canceled. Tapology.com mm -hmm. forced to withdraw from two of his last three. Most recently against Josh Emmett last December, UFC 296. So now at 35, Bry, yeah. he draws Trimley St. Martin's almighty Allen in his backyard. How do you foresee the main card opener playing out? Ooh, I love this fight, boys. Me I love too, this man. fight. This is such a good fight. And I've muttered on my own podcast, um, I've muttered the words um, overrated for both these guys. And, I, and, I, and I'm wrong. I'm admitting I'm wrong. Both these guys are solid. Um, however, I love Arnold Allen in this spot. I think he should be a bigger favorite. He has fought the Max Holloway fight. He's been there with Max, went five rounds. That learning experience alone in that is unbelievable. And then he goes against most of Evil Love, who he outstruck, but he got taken down by five times. And that guy's going to fight for a title soon. He's right there. And the only problem I had with him before the Max was he didn't fight enough. Now he's starting to get a rhythm. You know, he's a huge 45er, so the weight cuts are probably uh, a little bit of a problem there. But they both have a similar opponent in Calvin Cater. 
one loss and one not. MMA math, we're not doing that here. But if you look at Giga's record, right? It's a little weak, in my opinion. Some of his wins are weak. Take Edson Barboza out. Jamal Emmers is a fight that he's got a W on there. He lost that fight, in my opinion. He got outstruck. He got taken down too many times for me. He's very good in distance. The Giga kick, everything is phenomenal. But when you crowd him and you bully him, he falls apart a little bit. His take down offenses in question. His ground game's in question. I think Arnold Allen is a slam fucking dunk. I think this is going to be a big bet for your boy. I love Arnold Allen in this spot, and I've never been that confident in him. Yeah. But, man, I'm ready to take it to the bank. Nicely done. I like the conviction on Arnold Allen, who, Kenny, started 10-0 and in the octagon. Yeah. 10 and two now after a competitive loss to Mavsar Ivloyev. That was in January, UFC 297. Allen was right there. And in terms of contention, still kind of right there, ranked number six in the world, but in a must win situation here if he wants to fight for the belt anytime soon. Allen, the favorite, or Chikadze, the dog for you? Yeah, well, you know, we have to look at, you know, the, the level of competition. Uh, for these guys, and I think that for Allen, uh, what his last two fights are, are losses here mm-hmm. in in uh, Ivloyev and Holloway, uh, right? And then mm-hmm. um, so it, it's tricky. I, I think that um, Allen should be able to win this fight based on building off of that cater blueprint uh, that we saw against Chikadze. And I also think he should sprinkle in takedowns there. If he does that, he wins this fight. And he also is very good as a pressure fighter. Absolutely needs to watch out with those long range strikes. The Giga kick in particular is a shot that can take anybody out. You get hit with that thing, toes uh, digging Hmm. into your liver. uh, You're going to fold like a lawn chair. So he's got to be careful there. Uh, Allen, I think, is tough enough to maybe withstand that. Very few people are, though. But I like Allen here as well. Not as convicted as Brian, but I I think this is a good fight for him to get back on track. All right. Now we will circle back to a fight that is now number two on pay-per-view at middleweight. Christian Leroy Duncan, CLD minus 130. Gregory Rodriguez plus 110. So, Bry, CLD came... Mm -hmm to the UFC is a much hyped guy. He's three and one since coming three finishes, definite step up in class here. How do you think he handles this RoboCop challenge come Sunday morning? Christian Leroy Duncan. Have you guys ever seen that? (laughs) Leroy Jenkins, one of the greatest internet videos ever. I suggest you've seen it. It's one of the guys. I just like hearing you. uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. CLD. This is a guy who got co-signed by Sean Sheehan on this show. And it made me go look at him. When he debuted, he looked fantastic. He's got really good angles. He, The only thing I dislike about him is sometimes maybe his defense isn't what it needs to be and possibly volume. But he's coming off two knockout wins. He has power. He has some slickness to him. And I never pick RoboCop. Gregory Rodriguez, if you see me in person, I give you permission to beat the piss out of me because I never pick you. I get chirped. Because I picked Brad Tavares against him. And people were like, why are you on the Anakin Floyd show? You picked Brad Tavares as Gregory Rodriguez. No knock to Brad Tavares. But I never pick RoboCop, right? The 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 Jordan Williams knockout, who's a 170-pounder, knocked him out. And he's been yeah. knocked out before. That lingers with me. And I think with RoboCop, he's primarily a boxer. He goes in straight lines, right? And CLD's got good footwork. And he can move around and pot shot him. And I think CLD is going to land a shot here, man. I really do. I wasn't convicted earlier when we uh, early in the week when I looked at this, but I'm all in now. Give me CLD and uh, go look up the Leroy Jenkins video because it makes me look like an yeah, idiot. Well, if you guys don't know what it is. I've heard of that. Yeah, I've certainly heard of it. It's very funny. It's the best. Early yeah. internet. Early internet. Hilarious. Yeah. All right, Cam Flo. So for a lot of people, when they think of Gregory Rodriguez, I mean, I might think of his strength and condi- conditioning coaches at the Institute of Human Performance, JC and Rio San San- Santana, because they're my guys as well. Yeah. But when a lot of people think of this guy, Kenny, they think about the fucking cut on his forehead <sighs> yeah, in which you could see his skull. <laughs> but he's a really good fighter. I think maybe bordering on elite. He's six and two in the UFC. I don't know. Uh, two straight wins, wins in four of his last five. 
Top 15 probably going to be on the horizon for the winner. What are your thoughts here on uh, a pretty close fight on paper? Christian Leroy Duncan, the favorite, Gregory Rodriguez. This is a really interesting fight. You know, listen, Gregory Rodriguez has the kind of power that you have to respect. And if he lands the right shot against anyone, uh, he can put you out. I think where he struggles is exactly what Brian talked about, is in his footwork. He, He does attack in straight lines. And because of that, he gets hit a lot. CLD is a damn problem. And as good of an athlete as Gregory Rodriguez is, Christian Leroy Duncan is just a step above. The way that he moves, the athleticism that he exhibits in the cage, man, is extremely impressive. Uh, And I I don't think enough people are on the Christian Leroy Duncan train as of right now. So if you were to invest right in fighters, this is the kind of guy you want to sneak in and put your money behind because – I, I think it's kind of a bad fight for Rodriguez just based on the, the, the crazy angles, the vision that uh, CLD has. It's unlike a whole lot of guys in that division. So I'm pretty high on him as well. Um, so as, as long as he's like defensively solid heading into this and he's got to watch out for that Rodriguez power uh, because yeah. he has that kind of power that can change the fight in an instant. I like CLD as well. Give me CLD. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Nice. And shout out to Sean Sheehan as well, yeah. as Brian mentioned, for the uh, advanced scouting and uh, promotion paying attention. He gets added to pay-per-view against Gregory Rodriguez. And how fucking good is this middleweight division right now? Really good. All right. Featured bout of lightweight boys, UFC 304 live on pay-per-view. Another close one on paper. King Green, minus 125. Patty Pimblett, plus 105. So Green going to be 38 in September. Kind of looked 28 in defeating Jim Miller at UFC 300 back in April. Now he makes his 26 UFC appearance against Patty the Batty Pimblet. Pimblet 5 and 0 in the UFC, Brian, but mm-hmm. 21 and 3 is a pro, so mm-hmm. maybe more experienced than a lot of the masses and or naysayers may think. What do you think about this spot for Pimblet against King Green? I love this spot for him, actually. I do. This was this was one when it first got announced. I said that makes sense. Because I thought our boy uh Steamroller Favola was going to get this spot in, in, in his King Green. It makes sense. They've been chirping a little bit. I think Bobby called him out at one point. Bobby's fought fucking everybody. He's been in there with everybody. And I love that because they've been slow. I don't care if you're a Patty fan or a hater or whatever. The truth is they've been slow playing. They know what they have. This guy's charismatic. He's got the riz. And he's he's a good, every interview he does, it's electric. And he needs to turn that into a, an electric fighting style. Because his last two fights out have been a little meh, if, if I'm going to say so myself. But there's a star there at Patty. And this after this, there's no turning back. Baby gloves are off. Because King Green... No disrespecting King Green, but he is a benchmark for this division. You get past him, you look good against him. Heaven forbid you finish him. Now we're talking, right? But that's easier said than done, right? Bobby really, he's only been submitted twice. Those both were back in 2009. One was by Dan Lozon, who was, well, you know, we know Joe. Dan got him back in 2019 or 2009, excuse me. Besides that, he hasn't been, he hasn't been fin- uh, submitted. He gets finished on the feet sometimes. You know, he gets knocked out, carries his hand low. You know, as older age gets gets to him, he's 38. The reflexes aren't there. So I don't see Patty knocking him out. But Patty is very confident that he's going to get this fight to the ground and dominate. He can get Bobby down. Bobby isn't the, the world-class takedown defense, but he's hard to hold down. He's hard to keep down. And we really want to see how heavy Patty is on top. That's his bread and butter. People think he might be a striker because he his UFC debut got rocked and he knocked somebody out. His bread and butter is on the ground and on top and on the ground. And that's what he's going to have to do here. I'm surprised he's not a bigger underdog because there's a lot of Patty haters out there. The MMA Twitter thing is, I can't wait to fade Patty. I can't wait to fade Patty. Yeah. This is the spot to fade him. And I'm actually going to rock with him. I think he's going to win a decision here. I think he's just going to smother Bobby. But this is going to be no easy feat here. Bobby King Green, or just King Green, excuse me, is a legit dude and could knock Patty out. No, no problem doing it. But I just see Patty getting it done here, hometown soil. Hopefully, he's got his orange shorts on that he's been asking for, and yeah. we're going to see a really good performance from him. All right, I know Ken Flo's on the other side. We'll let him explain here in like 15 seconds, but I heard the name Dan Lozon, and maybe yeah. we should book Joe Lozon on the podcast, Kenny, at some point in time so he can tell the story, if memory serves, of his dad like needing him to beat the fuck out of Dan at a family <laughs> outing because Dan – Yeah, there's video, yeah, there's right? Video, so, so, is that a pig yeah. roast? Uh, so yeah. All right. So we will, uh, we will book Joe Lowe's on and hopefully he hasn't heard me haze him on the previous 501 <laughs> episodes of John, this program. I, John, but, uh, I think it's got back to him. I think he's, I think words got back to him. Yeah. No, me and Joe are tight. You know? I love Joe. Uh, 
But uh, me and Keith Florian will have some jokes. Uh, <laughs> nice conversations. Uh, all right. So Ken Flo, right. I know you like Bobby Green here as a slight favorite. Fucking King Green. Oops, I did it again. Yeah. Who do you like? I like King Green, man. I, I do. I, I just think that I know Patty's been working a lot on his takedown game. He's been working a lot with one of my favorite coaches right now in the game, and Justin Flores, who's based out of San Diego. Um, you know, high level judo and wrestling coach. Um, and that's what he needs in order to win this fight. He has to be dominant with his takedowns. Can he get to the clinch safely and consistently enough? I'm not so sure. Not a whole lot of styles like King Green, um, you know, and I think that that could throw him off. And as Brian talked about, I, I think the key is how does King Green and how does Patty, for that matter, perform in the UK? Um, I think King Green, based on his experience, should be fine. He's faced tougher competition, guys. I, I mean, you yeah. look at as far as names, um, that's why I'm pretty confident. I also think Patty has not, Fix the mistakes on the feet when it comes to striking. That chin is still in the air. That makes a big target for Mr. King Green. And I think he's going to land shots. I'm not sure he's going to finish them, but he certainly can. So watch out for that. I like King Green here. I might even like him pretty big. Ooh. I love the fight. I'm certainly higher on Patty Pimblett than most, but I think I've been quoted this week as saying after witnessing Bobby Green king green the speed and the vision at mm -hmm. ufc 300 so good. i said to myself that night like not fading him in his next spot even though yeah. contractually i can't fade or follow any of these guys all right co-headliner for the ufc interim heavyweight title tom aspinall minus 380 curtis razor blades plus 300 so aspinall kenny with a rare interim title defense here after he became the interim champion last november with the knockout of sergey pavlovich blades earning this shot for myriad reasons, I mean, largely you could say body of work. He had the huge knockout of Jailton Almeida at UFC 299 in Miami and also useful the head-to-head -head win over Tom Aspinall, even if that fight was 15 seconds back in 2022. So, Kemflo, we'll have you lead us off here with that backdrop. And now with title stakes, we arrive at the rematch. You like Aspinall the favorite? or Curtis Blades as the dog? You know, Blade, Blades has burnt me a lot over the last few years. Um you know, when you expect a lot from him, he doesn't really deliver. When you don't expect to a lot to him, he surprises you. And I think that, you know, his wrestling style um, is is going to be the key here. I think he needs to try to test the ground game of Aspinall. Where in Aspinall's guard, he does not want Aspinall on top of him. That happens. The fight's over, guys. I think Aspinall is that good and that dynamic with his uh, ground game. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot from him when he's on his back and when he's struggling with someone who has good ground and pound like Curtis Blades. Um, I think Curtis has good power on the feet, but I don't think he's ultra technical on the feet. And I haven't seen, I'm trying to remember a guy who's as light on their feet and moves as well and has the speed that Tom Aspinall has. I, I struggle to try to find a name who truly looks as fluid as him. And because of that, I just think you don't get a whole lot of athletes like that in the heavyweight division and who certainly comes from that background that he has, who has the finishing ability like Tom Aspinall. He's just different. I think he wins this fight. I think he gets the finish. Um, you know, the, the numbers obviously are pretty, pretty good in, in Aspinall's favor. So, you know, if you're looking for something to bet on Aspinall, you know, throw him in a parlay, throw him with a finish or something. But uh, I like Tom here. Curtis Blades have a ton of respect for. But Tom Aspinall, I just think he's that good, guys. It is pretty nuts, right? The division's consensus best grappler and also moves better than any heavyweight Jeez. on the feet. Mm -hmm. Ground and pound submissions. He's got it all. He's 7-1 and one of the UFC. Of course, the only loss to Curtis Blades, a fight in which he got injured early. All of his UFC fights have ended inside 345 of round one, except for one of them. Seems like he's a big game player as well. Just a monster in all phases of mixed martial arts. Curtis Blades on the other side. It's sort of an interesting case, right? Fought Francis Ngannou in his 2016 UFC debut. Fought Ngannou in two of his first eight UFC fights. He was the only guy to beat him in his first 12 in the UFC. Feels like this is a long time coming. Bro, I feel like yeah. he's going to fucking go for it and go out on his shield. I don't think mm -hmm. he's going to Manchester to wrestle. What are your thoughts on uh, the co-main event and the wide price on it? 
Yeah, I tell you, when Kenny was describing, you know, heavyweight light on his feet, he hasn't seen someone like that. I thought my name was going to follow that. So I'm a little, <laughs> excuse yeah. me for a second here. I'm a little ticket pack. I'm just kidding. This fight, listen, it's not as easy as the line says it is, right? Because Curtis Blades has only lost to three people, right? And they're big, heavy power punchers. And every time he gets knocked out, that's what he does. He climbs up that fucking hill again and looks phenomenal. And he does it over and over again. He's not flashy. He's not going to cut big promos. But he's a guy you can root behind. He's a guy that is a hardworking guy, clearly, right? So he has the tools to win this mm. fight with his grappling. But, you know, old Tommy Aspinall, uh, this dude is is for real, for real. Like, this dude is is next level. Like, he took Sergei, or Sergei Pavlovich on, like, a couple, like two weeks notice out of shape and said, fuck it. They're off for me in the interim title. I'm going to do it. That's a guy who I know believes in his skills and believes in his gym. And the most important thing, or one of the most important things, for heavyweights is finding other heavyweights to train with. Big boys are hard to come by. Big boys that are good are hard to come by. Brock Lesnar had a camp up in Minnesota uh, where he just had big boys out there. Pat Perry went out there. Yeah, That's smart to do because you need to feel another huge guy and toss him around. And Tommy has that. Not that he's so, and he's soaking his knuckles in gas, an old gypsy thing that he's yeah. doing. Like yeah. this guy is tough as shit. I love Aspinall, but I don't want to load up and say he's going to get it done when Curtis Blades is a legit dude. I think the line's a little wide. I think you could take Curtis Blades and be okay with it at that plus 300 number, but I'm already invested too much into Tommy Aspinall. I'm not going to turn my back on him now like I did Manel Cop earlier. Give me Tommy Aspinall. I like him by knockout too, quite a bit uh, as well. It's amazing how much media has changed since Ken Flo's prime. I mean, Ken Flo was soaking his elbows in fucking Ooh. petrol <laughs> like Ooh. 15 years ago. Nobody reports on it. All right, main event for UFC 304, Edwards versus Muhammad. Act two, Leon Edwards, minus 205. Bilal Muhammad, plus 170. First meeting, of course, short notice fight for Muhammad. It was during a global pandemic. It was at the mm -hmm. UFC Apex in a 25-foot octagon. The general safe Saud was in Bilal Muhammad's corner out of necessity. I'm not sure he has cornered him prior nor since. Since that fight, Muhammad 5-0, Edwards 4-0. Three of those, of course, title fight wins for Leon Bry. Yeah. He's become the standard upon which all welterweights are judged. Your thoughts on him in defense number three against Bilal Muhammad. I love this fight, boys. It finally happened. I mean, we obviously, we we... Everyone here, this podcast, whatnot, Jason and Nick, we have a connection with Bilal Muhammad. But Leon Edwards is no joke. Like, this dude is a legit, legit guy. And I had to take all that aside of how much I like Bilal and how much I respect him and really break this fight down based on what I see. And what I see with a guy like Leon is a guy who finally reached the mountaintop against Usman, who the first fight he was objectively losing, got taken out five times. And then found the head kick. Second fight, that head kick also gave Leon so much confidence. Goes into the second fight, very close with Usman. I did have Leon winning that fight, but it was very close. Then he gets Colby, right? And Colby looked kind of like a shell of himself, if I'm being honest with you. He shot him out. But a lot of those fights, the Usman 2, or the Usman 3, I guess, and Colby, there wasn't a ton of volume out of Leon. It was him hanging back, him trying to ma maintain his distance to throw those kicks that are phenomenal and stop takedowns. He didn't want to throw too much because he knew guys were shooting on him. He did get taken down by both guys. Usman got him down three times in the, or the third fight, and Colby got him down twice. He also took Colby down. His takedown offense is admired by guys like DC, which I don't take lightly. He developed a two-on-one hand technique that DC has talked about. That's phenomenal. But you got Bilal Muhammad, and everyone's talking about the first fight. Really, it comes down to the head kick that got through that wobble Bilal, right? That, that's what it was. There's only 18 strikes landed, but Leon looked to be sharper and, and more on fire. But Bilal gets better as it goes on. And if you look at who he's fought since that fight and what he's changed, the footwork we shot, we saw against Vicente Luque, that's something, the side-to-side -side move we haven't really seen. The fact that he didn't go for one takedown against Gilbert Burns outstruck him, landed 132 strikes. He finished Sean Brady, which no one's been able to do. He's not getting enough credit here. He's just not. For some reason, the fans aren't rallying behind this guy who's a great dude, who's a good humanitarian, funny as all get out, and is a great fighter and deserves his shot. The fact that this almost got skipped on him by like a Shavkak Rukmanov, who's amazing, but the fact that this almost got skipped over or rumored to get skipped over, I think is an outrageous. This fight needs to happen. I'm glad it's happening. I'm glad it's happening in, in England. Leon Edwards is phenomenal, but guess what? It's bully season. 
Give me the and new, baby. Wow. And we're going to wow. be interviewing him on the Anakin Florian podcast with a shiny new belt. How about that? Brian Peachy likes the underdog. Bilal Muhammad, Ken Flo, seemingly we're getting the best versions of both of these men. Really is a fight that needs to happen. Who do you have in the main event at 304, kid? And that's it, John. You know, you have two guys that are truly in their prime. You look at their records. They're almost identical. Um, you know, the quality of competition of both these. These guys are fighting each other at the perfect time. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this is a very, very tricky one. How do you go against Edwards, though, who does everything so damn well? And, you know, he doesn't throw a lot of volume. That's the one knock on him. But mm -hmm. so did freaking Floyd Mayweather. But when right. he throws, he lands. That's mm -hmm. the problem. And he almost he operates under that same kind of movement and intelligence of a Floyd Mayweather. When he sees something, he does something. If he doesn't see something, he doesn't throw anything. Um, so he never puts himself in danger, right? Um, the one thing we can kind of point back to is that fifth round against Nate Diaz. Maybe he got a little cocky. Maybe he got a little mm -hmm. tired. And maybe he underestimated Nate Diaz, who he was dominating uh, for the majority of that fight. But he did get caught. Not something you want to do against someone like Bilal. Now, Bilal is a guy who executes extremely well. He's good everywhere. He knows how to perform when the lights are bright. And uh, his conditioning can certainly be weaponized. And that's what he needs to do. He needs to get Leon to try to throw a lot more punches than he's comfortable throwing. Put himself like he's going to do something. Get out of the way. Be evasive. Get Leon frustrated. Uh, get him to miss. Get him to throw a lot. So later on, those kind of investments that he puts on early on in the fight pay off to where now he can really step on the gas and take it to Leon Edwards. Um, fascinating fight. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, for me, Edwards has the edge heading into this. It's hard for me to go against a guy who has been as consistent as him, who has gained confidence with some tremendous wins against one of the best welterweights we've ever seen in Kamaru Usman. Um, and uh, for me, it, it's tough. Am I going to bet on that one? I'll tell you right now, I am not. It, it's that close. I, I think Bilal has a great shot. Bilal has a great shot. And uh, I can't wait to see it, man. Wishing him the best of luck. Uh, but Edwards, man, he he's so damn good. He's so so damn technical. Yeah. Might be the best pound for pound fighter in the world. Yeah. All right. One final act. Place your bets. Brought to you by JohnAnik.com, where you can get 15% off your One More Sleep or Anik and Florian podcast merchandise design with promo code UFC304. Also, Bilal Muhammad's merchandise for UFC304 is up at JohnAnik.com. 100% of the proceeds go to those in need in Gaza. All right. We update the standings. UFC Fight Night, Lemosh versus John G. Doba. New rule, by the way, if you have a fight that gets no action before Saturday night, you can spend that extra money, Bri and okay. Kenny, in the future. Just push out a tweet, tag at Anna Florian Pod and everybody associated with the show. Good news. Because as you're chasing Ken Flo, certainly night would have been nice for you, Bri, to have that $500 that was no action with the straight wager on Jin Yong Park. Right. You hit your other bet, 500 straight on Mean Machine Steve Garcia. That paid you 350 to 11 so that is your plus number for the week. Shaves your nut down to 526.12 for the year. Team Florian year to date was about $1,459. You went with five $200 straight Ooh. wagers. Ooh. Two and three, you hit on Garcia and Janji Doba, lost on Durden, Algio, and Krushevsky. Total for the week for Kenflow, minus 318.30. Year to date, 11472 okay. The lead for Team Florian, $1,666.84. And that brings us to your selections and your wagers for UFC 304. As is the case for all pay-per-views, Bri, you yeah. will have two thousand dollars instead of the instead of the traditional one thousand to spend. So, two uh, K on UFC 304. How are you splitting up the cash, BP? So you know, I I, I try to be modest, right? But I'm getting out of the negatives after this weekend, boys. I'm Let's getting go. into the plus money, and we're starting off with a G. One G, one bar, one K on my guy, Arnold Allen. I I feel it. Feel it down to me, man. Arnold Allen, $1,000. <laughs> Let's go. Bilal, remember the name, slash, and new Muhammad for 300 
Let's go Tommy Aspinall by KO. The number's not out yet on DraftKings for another 300. Let's go Patty the Batty for 200. And then just a little two-legger, a little two-legger, a little cutesy, cutesy two-legger parlay. Muhammad Kaev in CLD, Leroy Duncan, plus 190 on DraftKings Sportsbook right now, $200. All right, so BP, $1,000 on Arnold Allen. That'll pay like 400 He also mm-hmm. likes Bilal Muhammad for 300 bucks. Tom Asp- Aspinall by knockout on the proposition front. Patty Pimblett straight for 200 And a two-leg parlay, Muhammad Mokayev and Christian Leroy Duncan. Ken Flo, lead is still robust. How are you spending your $2,000 at UFC 304? Okay, this is kind of silly. I'm not sure exactly why I'm doing this, but I'm, I'm trying to hedge. I'm trying to hedge on this Mokayev cop fight because I sure, do think sure. it's interesting. I'm going with uh, Mokayev for three hundred dollars. Okay, but I'm going to go with two hundred dollars on cap uh, on cop with um, an under two and a half rounds. Pick. Ooh, okay. Uh, and then I want to go with three hundred dollars on Parsons. Wow. Preston Parsons for 300 Parson. fading the Welsh gangster. Go yeah. on. I want $400 on CLD. Hey, yep. The East Coast family. Yep. Uh, and then let's go with $600 on green. What am I doing? Ooh. What am I doing? I, I'm I, the I king. like this. I like Love this the on king. green. King. Kenny, yeah, so that's the big, Kenny that's a big swing home. fight. For the cappers, yeah, yes. a little hedgehog, right? Little but hedgehog that's the big there. hedge. Uh, excuse me, the it. big swing fight for you guys this yeah. week. King Green and uh, Patty Pimblett at Brian Petrie MMA on social media. Enjoy the paper, you buddy. Right? And uh, huh? Dude, uh, Kenny, oh, got one sorry, Cam Flow. 500, I'm sorry, 800, and 400, 1200. Yes, Kenny, I'm so sorry. You got $200 left. We're My wrapping apology. you up. We're wapping it up, dude. Ken's got money to spend. <laughs> hey, that's all. Get the king. Get Florian <laughs> out of here. Uh, a $200 parlay. All right. We're doing Please. wood. Green, CLD, and Aspinall. Woo! Amazing. All right, BP, great job. We appreciate the extra work on 304. We will talk to you uh, in six or seven days' time, kid. You're the best. Have a good trip, Johnny. I'll see you. Thank you, my man. Brian Petrie with us for the main event challenge. <clears throat> and place your bets here on the Anik and Florian podcast. Interesting that he went 300 on Bilal Muhammad. It's, uh, I would think it would be a hard fight to bet, but uh, we'll yeah. see how it shakes out Saturday night. There is another episode from earlier this week, if you are so inclined to check that out, featuring Dominic Cruz and Daniel Cormier. Thanks, everybody, for supporting the show. If you want to check out our interviews with George St. Pierre and Kamar Usman and Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier and Chris Weidman, those are available on episode 500 on the DraftKings YouTube channel right now. Thanks to BP. Thanks to Kemflo. Thanks to Cody Merrow. I am very excited to be wheels up to Manchester, England, and uh, we'll be back with all of you fine folks to recap it probably live on Monday morning. Until then, be well, be safe, enjoy the pay-per-view Saturday. For Ken Flom, John Anik, we will talk to you soon. Yo, later. Hands on the bar, he's an open man, he's cornbread.